Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, we are having on a listener favorite. I can tell because I always get a lot of listens and downloads and views whenever I have her on. That is Jill Winger. She is the podcast host of Old Fashioned On Purpose, which is a podcast that I really enjoy listening to. She brings on guests to talk about a lot of the same things as mine, but then she also dives deeper into some places that I don't necessarily touch all that often. So if you like my podcast, you probably A, already follow hers, or B, should. And she also has the Prairie Homestead blog, the Prairie Homestead on YouTube, or Instagram, YouTube. You've likely, if you've been in this homestead world, been following along with Jill for a long time, which is why I probably have so many of you that enjoy listening to these. But without further ado, we're going to talk about old-fashioned living and why that would be something you'd want to do, how to get started, and then just chat with Jill Winger. Let's dive in. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Well, Jill, I'm so happy to have you back on. I'm sure most people that listen already know you, but for those who don't, tell us about you and your podcast and your blog. Yeah. Thanks for having me back on, Lisa. I always enjoy chatting. But yeah, I'm Jill Winger, and most people probably found me originally through my blog, The Prairie Homestead. I started it back in 2010, and then that has branched into all sorts of other things as it does. And um, right now, I think probably the place I show up the most often online is through my podcast, which is called Old Fashioned On Purpose, where we talk about homesteading, a lot of crossover with you, Lisa, of course, but also some other like more cultural topics, deep dives and things like that. So that's kind of who I am and what I do. Yeah, I enjoy your podcast. I do listen to every episode. So thank you. I I'm familiar with it. And we're going to talk a little bit about your message of Old Fashioned On Purpose in this episode. And why you think we are culturally shifting that way, and then some of the issues that people have whenever they are trying to shift that way, whether it be from overwhelm or just not growing up with those kind of skills. So first question for you is, why do you think people are more drawn to homesteading and old-fashioned living at this day and age, like right now? Yeah, Uh, I think that humans are really good at swinging on a pendulum. (laughs) We tend to go to extremes and overcorrect, and and you see that a lot throughout history. And I've spent a lot of time reading and researching this whole topic for the last, I don't know, almost two years. I've been writing a book based on it. And so I spent a lot of time reading really nerdy books that all my friends were like, you're reading what? But it was really interesting just to see, you know, this progression of, of marching towards the industrial revolution and all those pieces that came together. And then the excitement around that and how much it changed our life. Historians say it's one of the most impactful events in all of human history. Uh, and I think that we got, we as a culture, right? Decades worth of of weeds. We got so hung up on the excitement and the technology and the advancements that we lost ourselves a little bit. And I think that it started before COVID, but I believe that COVID accelerated Mm -hmm. that awareness of like, we're all, you know, feeling a little out of whack. We're feeling a little uncentered. We're wondering why are we unhappy? Why are we depressed? Why are we unhealthy? And I think that we're starting to look at the causes for that. Maybe I think for some people it's more subconscious than conscious. But I think that's why we're seeing this resurgence in interest in farmhouse life mm-hmm. and interest in even just decorating or farm fresh food or homesteading. And I think it's a little bit of a correction from that that extreme, which is really, really important right now. Yeah, I noticed the huge acceleration of the interest in this around the COVID time. And I kept thinking that it was going to go back to how it was before. But instead, I see it it continues to snowball. Like with the content that I put out and that you put out, I'm sure you noticed that too, that it's not dying down anytime soon. No. And I remember, I'm I'm sure, I don't know if you thought this as well, but like during those early days of COVID when everything was so in so much upheaval, I remember going to my husband and going, you know, I don't know, people aren't going to want my content anymore. Like this, no one cares. No one's going to care about gardening and homesteading, and it, which was hilarious oh, because yeah. <laughs> I never <laughs> would have thought that all of a sudden that would cause this interest in baking bread and sourdough. So unexpected on my part. I didn't didn't prophesy that one very well, but yeah, it's. I think it's 
it's been good. I think it's a good thing, a good side effect of COVID, which of course in and of itself wasn't good, but I'm glad that this happened as a result. It makes me wonder though, with you saying like when this all started in the industrial revolution, I think back to my grandma and I have one grandma who is like 15 years older than my other grandma. And the difference there is one that butchered the chicken from scratch, made bread, and then the other one who literally made everything from cans. Like she did not know how to make something yes. that wasn't from cans. It makes me wonder though, what things that we're doing now that maybe will be that, that seem so latest and greatest that make our lives better, that they they do make our lives more convenient, but there might be some kind of downside we're not seeing. I don't know if you've thought about that. I think about that all the time. And I always think back, especially to those instances, a lot of them happen in the medical world where it's like, oh, take this weight loss drug or take this thing while you're pregnant. And then, you know, they find out four decades later that it was causing babies to be born without arms or people were dying from it and they couldn't figure it out. So I think about that all the time. One piece that I think about a lot right now is this whole AI explosion. Mm, yeah. That's starting to be like something I, I almost can't ignore with my business, but I'm like, I've been trying to ignore can I just it. And keep it's ignoring like, it? you know, it's just, it's coming. I'm yeah. Go, I'm, I'm still I'm, ignoring We can it. ignore it together <laughs> for a little while longer, but I'm looking at, you know, all of the ways people are like, Oh, this is going to be so amazing. <laughs> and it'll do this and that and this. And I'm, I'm sure there will be some benefits, but I'm also like, in 60 years, what will we be looking back at this exact time period and going, Oh man, they didn't see it coming. Look, yeah. what it, look what happened. And so, yeah, it happens all the time. There has to be some blind spots. I think the thing that comes to mind for me, which I still participate heavily in, is silly as it is, is grocery delivery. So I know you live kind of in the middle of nowhere. So you do Azure Standard, you do whatever, like you do a big monthly grocery shop or whatever. I live so close to town that I can literally get Instacart, Walmart Plus, and it is the most convenient thing in the world. I think it saves money because I only just buy what's suggested each week. It's like the same stuff over and over again. Obviously, I source a lot of things from local farms. But my daughter, she reminisces so much to when we used to go to the grocery store and like see people. Oh, my goodness. I'm like, that oh, is so yeah. funny. We don't, though. We never <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not saying I'm giving it up, but yeah, just little yeah. things like that. I think if I lived close enough to the grocery store, I would get it delivered because I do not love going to the grocery yeah. store. But maybe our children, maybe they will be the ones like pioneering this crazy revival in in-person. They will. <laughs> yes. Like stranger things have uh -huh. happened. Yeah, yeah. My my daughter, she, well, I have one daughter that's very much an extrovert and the other one that isn't. And so she couldn't care less. But the one that is, she says that she will not be doing Instacart or Walmart Plus when she's an adult because... She misses oh those outings. I'm like, is this is this one of those things? But AI definitely seems like yeah. a, a step even further because, I mean, I was listening to this podcast yesterday and it, it made me think like, oh, I could literally eliminate like people who answer my emails and all of the stuff that I currently have help with or that I spend a lot of time doing myself. And it sounds yeah. great, but also... One, I hate learning new stuff. I just don't like it. I'm like so resistant to that. Yes. And then two, uh, just it seems so wrong, you know? Yeah. And I, I will confess, I have played around with chat GPT. I still can't say That's it That's the one. That's the That's one I'm the looking one. I know. I know. And yeah. I played around because it's free, right? So I can be convinced. Anybody... <laughs> yes. In case anyone's not familiar, it's just this open, it's open source right now. You can use it for free. I think they're trying to get us all hooked on it. And then we have to pay a mm -hmm. subscription, of course, but you can go yeah. and ask it like you would Google. Like, um, so the other day, my husband, we're, we're helping with this big project of starting a charter school and he needed some really just run of the mill, busy work type job descriptions, more of like a, it was just a, it's kind of a boilerplate yeah. sort of thing. And so I was like, don't write that from scratch. I'm like, go into chat GPT and ask it to write a job description for a school director. Cause it's not going to go on the website. It's nothing. It's going to be forward facing. And it did. And it did a really nice job yeah, and it right. sounded human. It didn't sound <laughs> robotic. And I'm like, Ooh, it yeah. took like five seconds to do that. And it would have taken someone else a couple hours. Uh huh. So I'm like, for stuff like that, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, but we, we all, we, we're still going to need a human touch on so much. And I think that's, that's the balance with all of these topics, grocery delivery versus not, or, you know, growing your own food versus not, there's always pros and cons. And I think as modern individuals, we get to make those choices and we have to have that wisdom to understand the nuance. And I think that's where that, that juggling act really comes into play. 
Yeah. And it's important to at least think about it, which is definitely what you're doing through your message. This isn't something that we're just going to just, you know, go along with without considering it. I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about the episode sponsor, Tubes & Co. I have talked about Tubes & Co. here on this podcast for a while, and that is because I genuinely love the products. Tubes & Co. is a small, family-run company, and it's made right here in the USA. I love it when I find small companies like that that I can feel really good about supporting, but then also that have products I don't feel like I'm compromising on. Like, okay, I'm buying this to support this company, but I'd really rather buy the drugstore stuff. Not the case at all in the case of Tubes & Co. They are an organic skincare company that uses quality ingredients like grass-fed tallow, nothing artificial or bad. You can be confident whenever you look through the ingredient list that it's all stuff that you would not mind putting on your skin. Your skin's the largest organ in your body and things that go on it can actually absorb in. I've been recommending these to everybody. Actually, just the other day, my mom texted me and my sister and said, hey, I'm putting a tube sorter in. Anybody need anything? Because we all love their makeup so much. Now, I've loved their tallow balm all winter. I keep it in a very prominent place in my house. Well, just right in the bathroom where I walk by it nonstop. So I can put it on my face often on a day where I'm not wearing makeup. I'll try to put it on three or four times so that way I keep my skin hydrated in these winter months. And I love how it absorbs in, unlike a lot of natural products. But the makeup, we love it. I have their liquid foundation. I have this eyebrow thing that's two-sided, so it makes it really easy to groom everything, their mascara. Really, I love every makeup product that I've tried by them. I have the, the highlighter, the concealer, I don't wear makeup every single day, but I do like to have a nice collection for podcasts and videos and, you know, going out with my husband. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off your order by using the code FARMHOUSE. So visit tubesandco.com and use the code FARMHOUSE. So what are some examples of old-fashioned practices that create a positive domino effect, maybe it seems like, okay, what could the value of this be? I could just, I struggle with this. Well, I could easily source this probably cheaper, maybe even higher quality. For example, something, an example of this would be like sewing. I love sewing Mm -hmm. and I used to love it even more. And now I get too into the, like thinking through the time, the money and being like, this isn't actually worth it. But how could that create, you know, a domino effect into some other positive things? Yes. I I love this question. And it's something, you know, when I first started homesteading, I was really into it for very singular results, which is normal. And that's expected. You know, I was cooking the sourdough bread so I could get the sourdough bread and I was growing the tomatoes so I could Mm. have some tomatoes. And as I've gone farther into this journey, I've realized there is so much else happening. And so now when I look at baking sourdough bread, which I know you talk about this a ton. You're like my favorite sourdough recipe creator. <laughs> I look at it for the the bread, right? So I don't have to buy bread at the grocery store, but that's great. Uh, and then I also look at it for the health benefits, right? Of the fermented grains. Like, can I get bread cheaper at the store than what it takes me to create sourdough? Yes, absolutely. But I can't even get true sourdough bread in my area. I can't, I can't buy it. Mm -hmm, So that, that ups it on my value scale a little bit. Yes. And then I think about all of the feelings I get and the peace that comes when I am working on the bread, even though it doesn't take very long, just those minutes of, of creating and kneading and slowing down. Um, Mm -hmm. I usually assemble my doughs when the kids are in bed and it just is kind of, it's kind of me time, which, which sounds really weird to probably some people. Oh, I do it too. Yeah. Yeah. It's quiet and it's peaceful (laughs) and it brings me kind of back into my body after a day when I'm, you know, doing podcasts and outside and writing emails and working on projects. So there's the mental health Mm -hmm. benefits. And then I think about the lack of waste that... I'm or I'm the the waste I'm not creating by having to buy bread in plastic bags and and ship loaves of bread to me and then drive to the store and get it. Obviously, the flour and the or the wheat had to come to me in some fashion, but I'm not creating as much packaging. Mm-hmm. And so I have in one act, one old fashioned act, I have better food, better health with those probiotics and um, pre digested flours, better mental health, and I've made um, a better choice in terms of environmental stewardship. 
So when mm-hmm. I start to see these, these acts, whether we're baking bread, we're growing tomatoes, we're making soap, we're, we're sewing a dress, like to me, that makes that value that much higher. So how do you decide whenever, you know, clearly you can't do all of it and there's, there's some things that you, you know, decide, okay, I'm going to actually outsource this, but I want to put my hand to this. It's a nice modern benefit that we get to do that. How do you decide which ones you mentioned access? And that, that to me is like, like, that's my reason for having a dairy cow. I can get milk, raw milk around here, but I can't get it every day fresh, which is, you know, unless I want to go to the farm literally every day. So to me, that versus like having a farmer that I partner with, you know, that I get all my meat from, well, I can get that in one, you know, huge order and put it in the freezer. And so maybe that's something that I can afford to just go ahead and buy from a farm. How do you decide with some of those factors? Yes. That is the million dollar question. And I feel like it's such a personal one. I really try to avoid making hard and fast rules because we all have such different situations. Mm -hmm. For me, I think what I look at is does this act, whether it's baking bread or sewing or I don't know, washing clothes by hand, does it, is it going to bring me joy or is it going to bring me stress? And sometimes that answer is a little muddy because sometimes, you know, there are days when I am committed to baking bread and I'm trying to get out the door and I'm throwing the ingredients together. And it's not like this peaceful birds are singing, butterflies flying around. <laughs> Sometimes we do things we don't want to do. And that's just called being an adult. So, mm-hmm. um, but, but within reason, like if the act brings me overall joy, then I'm going to probably opt for it. So those things that would fall into that category for me are gardening. There are days I don't love gardening. There are days when I'm like, it's hot and I'm sweaty and, you know, I'm knee deep in weeds. But for the most part, gardening yeah. brings me joy. It brings me peace. Baking bread without a bread machine is that for me. I don't think bread machines are evil, Mm -hmm. but I love feeling the dough. It's important to me to feel the dough. Yeah. Now contrast that with washing clothes by hand. Some people do that. They have the ringer washer or they have the washboard, Mm -hmm. or there's a lot of those blogs that have the plunger in a bucket (laughs) method. They're off grid. Mm -hmm. That makes me feel instantly like sweaty and like my pulse, you know, increases. I'm like, I don't want to do that. That doesn't feel like that's speaking to me, but that might speak to someone else. And so I just, you just kind of have to weigh it, I think on a personal level. Also what, you know, if you're working outside the home, you're going to have less time to, to do all the things you're going to have to get really strategic about what's most important to you and what makes the biggest impact. Yeah. A few days ago, there was a big stomach bug going around everywhere. Like everybody who came into contact with it, got it. And so we had Eight of nine people in my family get it. And my sister and I are both talking about the washer and just how it brings us so much joy that that is what we have. Like, this is not even a big deal. We have a washer. So yeah, I don't think I'd find much joy in that. But as far as the gardening and the bread, there's this, okay, yes, we could, well, bread really, I can't source good quality sourdough bread here at all either, but like vegetables and stuff. I could, I could source that from local people. However, I need to not always, we need to not put just monetary values on things like, okay, does this make sense? Because people, you know, you're a, you're a homestead educator. You get questions all the time. Does it pay off to have, you know, a dozen chickens? Does it pay off to have a dairy cow? And the questions, well, in what way? (laughs) Cause maybe not like when you're looking at economies of scale and people having farms, having thousands and thousands of chickens, not really, not really, but yeah. <laughs> but it's more than that. Like you said, yeah, you're at, in what way? I think that's that's the million dollar question is we, we're looking at that bigger picture, which to me, that's as I've matured in my homesteading journey, I think that's what's been my biggest takeaway is it's a lot bigger and it's a lot more interconnected than I originally thought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about how we have, we've only ever had one dairy cow and we've only not calf shared for like when the cow was 12 months to 18 months past freshening. So it was like, you know, we've never had a large amount of milk. However, we have one that's six months past. We're about to get rid of her calf and one that's going to calve soon. I'm like, we're going to have so much milk and I can either get rid of one of them or dry her off, which I might, or maybe we'll get a couple pigs and we'll like make this whole thing connect together and figure out how we could do all of that. And my sister raises good high quality pork. And so I can, I have a source for it, but yeah, it does. It kind of fits together and you, you find your ways to make it to where it's 
it's not that difficult once you learn how to get some of these things into your routine, like your bread. You don't probably have to look at a recipe anymore. Not really. Every once in a while. I, I don't know. Do you do this? Do you just like get bored sometimes with the recipes that are tried and true and then you have to mix it up and then it's like you sabotage yourself? Do you ever do that? I kind of stick with like I have one bread recipe that's my favorite and I probably wish it wasn't okay. because it's not which I was I listened to your episode on whole grain and I'm like I really should figure out how to make that more fun again because I have recipes for that and I enjoy it but like I like the one that's a mix and that I can score into and it looks really beautiful and I do kind of stick yeah. to that one yeah I, I should do that because it's easy, right? I don't have to have a recipe in it. I yeah. know it works and I get consistent results. And my husband's always like, just stick with the one that you know works. <laughs> but I'm like, no, I need adventure. I need yeah. to try 100% rye, which has a high failure rate. I've done to that. See if I can do it. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I do have those, the ones that I use when I know like companies coming over, I have to make something edible. That's going to turn out. For sure. It's not, yeah, it's not stressful like it used to be for sure. Okay. So you're adventurous. You like to switch things up, learn new things. You get bored. What advice do you have for those who are drawn to this, but maybe don't have that same personality and are just feeling totally overwhelmed at even thinking about starting any of it? Yeah. So I still get overwhelmed for sure. I think my best bit of advice for that, and this is what I do with myself, even though I'm a little bit, I say I like organized chaos. That's how I roll. But <laughs> have have one aspect of life, whether that maybe, maybe it's in business, maybe it's in your job, maybe it's in your kitchen or your homestead that you're, you're actively learning something new. Like you're the beginner and, and let that happen one thing at a time, if possible, sometimes life doesn't allow that. Mm -hmm. And then sp spend your energy becoming an expert or starting that expert process in that. So for example, right now, I'm working on learning how to do freshly ground flowers. I've dabbled with it. I've never excelled in it. So I'm putting a lot of effort and energy into how do I use this flower? How do I grind it better? How do I use it with sourdough? I'm reading all the books. Mm -hmm. But once my cow freshens next month, I'm guessing that I will not be trying to figure out all the sourdough things. I'm going to be back right. into cheese making mode. Yeah. And I'm not going to try to do both of those at once. I'll probably go back to my boring sourdough recipe that I can make in my sleep. Yeah. Um, and then once the garden, if I'm going to try a new garden technique this year, then I'm going to just let that be my focus. And so as you go along in your journey, you have those skills, whether they're in the kitchen or the barnyard or the garden that become comfortable in second nature. So yeah. eventually, you know, you won't, you don't have to think about the practice of milking the cow every day. It's just a habit. It just happens. And you don't have to think about um, the practice of putting a, a, a supper on the table. You and I had that awesome podcast episode about that. You came on my podcast and just talked about how we don't really menu plan. We just kind of have this routine that just runs in the background mm -hmm. and it just works. But if you're new to cooking from scratch, that's not going to be your reality yet. So I think it's learning one big thing at a time and then building on that as you go and not trying to do it all at once. Because when I have done that, that's when I crash and burn in the most spectacular fashions. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you on the uh, cheese this summer. I've, I, this has been like, we've been milking now for two years. I know you've been milking for way longer than that. So we're still pretty new to it. And we've always had enough to drink, make yogurt, make butter, the things that I know just how to do, no problem. And I have not gone into cheese and I keep saying I'm going to, but there hasn't really been a reason because I haven't. I haven't done this. We haven't had five gallons of milk a day. Yes. But I am, I'm determined that I'm going to be learning cheese this summer as well or spring. To be so. perfectly honest, we had, I didn't, well, we had a cow for since 2011 and I didn't start making hard cheeses until 2021. And I was forced to okay. because our calf died that year and I had the choice of either drying her oh, up okay. or milking twice a day. And I'm like, well, I'm not drying her up uh, right now. So we milked twice a yeah. day. And for the first time ever, I had so much milk because we'd always done what you did right yes. you just kind of get what you need and call it good yeah which it's just a manageable yeah. amount i mean it, like for our family size we can drink a gallon yes. a day. that's no problem yes. which and i yeah. still prefer that route because it's less stress on me twice a day was yeah <laughs> it was everything the old timers said it was you know oh you got to be home you can't have social events very easily because you got to get home in time yeah. but man we had so much milk i had all the cream and it was a blast to yes. play with so i it took me a long time to get to that point though You'll probably be faster than me, but it was, it was a, a I don't while. Know. <laughs> so are hard cheeses fairly straightforward? I've done mozzarella a lot, but I've never done hard cheeses. Is it like, do you get to the point where you know just what you're doing? Like, it's just like pretty simple or not? It, I did get to that point. 
Although there were still blocks that I'm like, I'm doing everything the same and it magically did not work out this time. Okay. And some get contaminated. I'm sure you maybe have seen that where they get different yeasts. Like if you have bread yeast floating around, they can contaminate oh, your cheese. Yeah. I'll, I'll never that. forget that, that it was like I had left it uh, drying on the counter overnight and Christian comes up the next morning. He's like, your cheese is rising. And I'm like, no, it's not. Cheese oh, doesn't no. rise. And I walked over and I'm like, <laughs> oh my word, the cheese is rising. <laughs> So that wasn't great. But there there are some weird variables, at least that I didn't fully understand yet Okay, that would throw me off. I'm sure people, I mean, it's the same with sourdough. Once you're used to sourdough, you kind of know why it doesn't work, right? Yes. When things right. go wrong. Mm-hmm. I haven't been, I'm not to that point with cheese quite yet, but okay. I think you can. And Kate from Venison for Dinner, I love her yes. techniques yes. and Robin from Cheese from Scratch. Yes. I have like both of their courses. Good. I'm I'm fully planning on. <laughs> yeah. Those are the ones like those are the two people that I'm fully planning to. Yeah. Figure You'll this be out fine. from. You'll be good because yeah. too many. Of, I, I felt like a, a lot of the other cheese books I had were for artisan craft cheese makers. Right. I just need which, like farm. They weren't homes. homestead moms. Yeah. We need farm farm cheese. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. I'm I'm really wanting to do it. I've been saying it for two years and it just hasn't been that important at the moment. Yes. But it's gonna yes. it's gonna be, or we're gonna have to get rid of a cow, <laughs> or get another cow. Exactly. <laughs> Ultimatums, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, I want to say thank you to today's episode sponsor, Carly Jean Los Angeles. Now, Carly Jean Los Angeles is an LA-based company that started by Carly Brandon, a mom of four, who wanted to simplify the way that women get dressed. I have found it difficult over the years finding quality pieces without just buying something here and there and then having this very mixed up closet and still feeling like I have nothing to wear. Carly Jean has these capsule collections and they also have mix and match pieces that really fit together so that I can curate a wardrobe that I can use year after year. So I have the jeans I'm wearing right now are from Carly Jean. I wore them last year. This year I'm just wearing them with a little maternity band thing so that way I can still wear them. They've worked through lots of different life stages and seasons. I have dresses by Carly Jean that I absolutely love. I wore one Easter Sunday and my daughter was just beyond delighted with that because she loves it whenever I dress like fancy in her opinion. Very down to earth clothing but also you can look put together for a special morning like Easter morning throughout different seasons of life, small kids, pregnancy, not pregnant, postpartum. I have found many pieces from Carly Jean that have worked through all of that. Carly Jean's mission is to simplify getting dressed and help women feel beautiful in every season of life with classic, timeless, pieces that are meant to be lived in, not just worn for one occasion or never again. All of the CJLA basics are made right here in the US. You can feel good about that. And I feel that in a lot of ways, whenever I source pieces very intentionally, I actually end up spending less money because I keep them in my collection for so long and they actually get use. I wear my clothes out. I wear them until they either have holes or stains or so no way that they could still be used but I wear them for a really long time and make sure that I have the kind of pieces that will last both style wise and of course, in durability. Carly Jean is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 20% off your order. It's a one-time use code, but you can do it off your entire order by using the code FARMHOUSE20. So go to carlyjeanlosangeles.com. Again, use the code FARMHOUSE20 to get 20% off your entire order. Thanks so much to Carly Jean, one of my favorite clothing companies, for sponsoring this episode. Okay, so I have a few listener questions that we put up on Instagram. We put up a box and just ask what people want to hear from Joe Winger. So let's see here. The first category is history of modernization, which we talked about a bit. So maybe we'll have something to add to this. Maybe not. What are some examples of practices that should have never been modernized? And some that were necessary mm. for human safety and development that you were glad we had. We talked about the washer, medical stuff, yeah. penicillin. Great. Medical. <laughs> I know, penicillin. It's that is such a hard question. And I, I I think my new favorite word in this stage of my life is nuance. Yeah. Because I think we have to be so careful of putting things into black and white categories. And even on this topic where I naturally my bias is towards modernity is bad, old fashioned good. Like I think that's a really dangerous. Yeah. place to be if we create that stringent rule. So 
I don't know. I have a hard time saying any one thing is like definitively bad. Like, like antibiotics, penicillin's a great one. You know, we overuse antibiotics in our modern culture. Right. We overuse them on our animals. We overuse them on ourselves. And because of that, we're, we're dealing with antibiotic resistance. But my grandfather wouldn't be alive if not for penicillin. He had right. strep throat and he got it just in time back in those early days when it, it wasn't so common. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I feel like there's always the good and the bad that we have to weigh, whether we're talking about transportation, we're talking about medicine. We're even talking about our modern education systems. There's a lot, Mm -hmm. you have to look at all the different factors and there's goods and bads to each. Yep. I completely agree. And sometimes I feel like I say that and people still don't, don't hear me (laughs) like, you know, yeah. (laughs) Sitting in the middle is a harder place to be. You always can find more, I think, support when you're on either extreme. The middle isn't as fun and it takes a lot more mental energy to stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. And it also requires you to take in new information and pivot on things and that to be okay, you know, somewhere in the middle. So two things can be true at once. Yes. Is there a historical industrial advancement point where we should have stopped modernizing and been satisfied with where we were? Did we go too Mm. far or did we go in a wrong direction? Mm. I mean, I think it's a hard one. That's a hard one. I think that I, I would look more industry by industry. And again, I think there's still good and bad. Like, I think we are going too far, right? As we speak in the industrial food realm, when we're starting to do everything in laboratories and, you know, these animals are in horrific conditions in factory farms and our food is devoid of nutrients and it's stripping soil fertility and we're losing topsoil. I think that's too far. Mm -hmm. I know there are people who would argue that that's the only way to feed the world, which is a whole nother conversation, but um, even those people though are swaying. I don't know if you've noticed, but um, that is not what they would have said 10 years ago is changing now. Yes, It's fascinating. So I think, yeah. And I think potentially, you know, the medical system has gone too far in some aspects of um, throwing drugs at everything and not looking at root causes and not looking at the holistic aspects. So I I would say kind of on an industry by industry basis that we've gone too far in a lot of areas. And if you can figure out how to harness what we have here, we really do live in the best time because we have we all the resources to learn everything. Like you were saying, go check out venison for dinner and cheese from scratch. And now I can learn here in Missouri how to make cheese. And then I can also, if my child breaks their arm, we can go over to the hospital. Or if, you know, I have a, a home birth and I, you know, something goes wrong there and I need to transfer over to the hospital. We just have it all, really. If we can figure out how to not, you know, be on our smartphones for 24 hours a day and yet still learn the valuable things that we need to learn. Right. And I, the irony is not lost on me that, you know, I get to sit here in my comfortable office with all this technology uh, and an internet connection that's up in this, sa- it's a satellite, you know, postulating Yeah, in the about, middle of nowhere where yeah, you live. <laughs> middle of nowhere on the prairie, postulating about the evils of modernity. Like, you know, the irony yes. is not lost on me, right? I get it. Like, I don't, yeah. I'm glad, I'm thankful to be born now. I just think we have to use our brains to figure out which pieces we take and which pieces we leave. And there is a disadvantage to too much convenience. That's where we end up just feeling worthless about ourselves because we have too much time to think about things that we shouldn't be thinking about. So there's that too. It's good to be busy and to learn or, you know, to learn, to work, to do stuff that seems like, well, I shouldn't have to do that anymore. Well, this is where we get too much time on our hands too. Exactly. Yeah. That pendulum again. Too much convenience. Yes. Yeah, too much ease. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the next set of questions has to do with getting started. And I don't think we'll get through all of these, but we'll just do what we can. What okay. modern conveniences do you choose to go without? Um, so sometimes just silly things. Like I don't like a lot of the modern kind of, I call them gimmicky kitchen appliances, although everyone has preferences. No judgment mm-hmm. if that's a, a thing for someone. I don't, I am no one yell at me. I'm not saying it's, it's bad. I don't, I don't want an air fryer. I know some people say they're the best thing ever. You know, I don't have a panini press. I, I stick, I, I don't have a rice cooker. I just try to keep a lot of those plug-in appliances to a minimum. I have an instant pot, have a crock pot. 
I have a food processor. So yeah, I'm not you a have purist. your things. Just you have can't have all of them. Can't have all of them, and I just don't like the clutter of a modern kitchen. Mm-hmm. Another yeah. thing, I'm I'm not a fan of personally. Again, personal preference. I don't like all the smart home stuff. I don't. I'm not a fan of all oh, the, yeah. you know, Alexa, close my drapes and turn on my music and oh my goodness. All that. I am so with you on that. Yeah. Uh, I do not need Wi-Fi in my blinds or whatever. <laughs> I know. Or a refrigerator. No. I'm like, I, I feel offended by the Wi-Fi refrigerators. I don't know why. I do too. It just upsets my sensibility. Yeah. I same with my <laughs> washer. One, we picked the most bare yeah. bones. Just it literally just has the drum and it has like a certain number yep. of steel parts <laughs> yes. and it just you press it go. Yep. So I'm not saying those are wrong or sinful. I just like personal preference. They bother me. <laughs> so I don't have them. Yeah. Well, some people yeah. like figuring stuff like that out. That brings them joy to like figure out how to have like all the latest and greatest and make things work. I don't like figuring stuff out. I Same. don't. I yeah. do what I have to do. Yes. Yes, exactly. Like we, we got a updated vehicle last month. And I'm just like angry that it's trying to like, it's like, you know, it decides that it's going to slow down when I'm on cruise control. I'm like, I did not tell you to do that. And I was, I told my husband, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. next vehicle, I just want like crank up windows. Like I just, I don't want the buttons. I don't want the technology. Um, okay. Yeah. Careful what you wish for though. Be careful. We I know. had, when we had our seventh kid, we had to buy the, um, Nissan NV like 12 passenger van because we couldn't fit in our Odyssey. And we had that through six kids. And we had to have it like special ordered to the dealership. And when we got there, like we'd already agreed to buy it because it was, it was during 2021. It wasn't like you could find vehicles. This was a very specialty vehicle being that it had 12 seats. It has no power locks, no power windows. And the guy said, but you said you'd buy it. I'm like, but (laughs) I just assumed it had all that. So we don't, we have nothing. It is the most stripped. It does not even have cruise control. It has oh my nothing goodness. at all. Oh my goodness. Okay. You can't charge okay. your phone and play it at the same time. Like you have to use either the aux cord or the charger <laughs> and we'll never change it because having to like sell a vehicle, buy a vehicle, change the title is not enough to, for us to, sure. to take care of that. Sure. Okay. <laughs> so you brought, you brought good perspective we, and I will we literally say have it. <laughs> you have it. Okay. Maybe I'm too far on the, the, the hand crank windows. I do like my seat heaters. See, I'm a hypocrite. I like my seat heaters, but I don't want the cruise well, control assist. I don't know. It's a personal problem. Well, when I we had the Odyssey yeah. though, it was, it had all the bells and whistles, which was what we had before this vehicle. And the, the sliding doors that you control with buttons did make me mad. They did a lot. Of, yeah. They like screwed up. Like they would just go. And I'm like, can I just yeah. open the door when I want to yeah. open the door? Exactly. So I get it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was a rant I didn't expect to go on, but it just like came out. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I, I understand. If only we could just pick and choose which, which ones we'll take, you know? Yes. Okay. Yes. So what are the top skills? This is, a, this is from a listener. What are the top skills I could be learning now while I live in town before moving out to land? And I have a lot to say about this because we've only been on land. Yeah. When I say land, I mean seven acres for four years. I feel like you are such a great example of this because you... It's so funny because I forever, I think everyone did. I thought you were on a farm because you were so, f- you had all the farm skills when you were living in town. Like, yeah, for, well, forever. you can do it all. You can, you do can do it all. Yeah. All the food sourcing, all of the sourdough bread, all of the fermenting, the grinding your own grains, the garden, the chickens, at least we could where we lived all yeah. on a quarter acre. The only thing we've added is more space for the kids to run in a dairy cow. Literally. That's for it. sure. Yeah. And I, yeah, you are the, the, a beautiful example of that. I, and I agree. It's just, it's the food. If you can do one thing, start with the food because it affects you three times a day, at least it's going to make you feel better mentally and physically. It's going to make an, an impact on the environment. If you're sourcing better, if you're thinking about what you're buying, if you're thinking about what you're eating and there's all these amazing fun skills that you can start to master while you're in that waiting period. So I'm always like food, 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 go, go to the kitchen and, and have, have fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's pretty much nothing you can't do there because you can always find a local farmer that can provide you with those things. And I know I do live in, I probably live in like a really convenient area for that. I don't know, because it is pretty simple for me to find that. Find people, But I think most people can find at least something, even if it's not perfect. Right. And yeah, being willing to compromise a little and that's okay. But I love there's more options now than there was when I started for sure. Like- more yeah, farmers I mean, you markets, can get stuff more. Shipped. Yeah, the shipping Ooh. it's it's incredible. What a what a time to be alive. Yeah, you can get all of that <laughs> stuff much more easily. Yeah. 
Okay, what is the first area of your life that you decided to do things differently from the modern way? And I think it's going to be food related, probably. Food related. Um, or, or is it food related? If it's not, that's okay. What It might yeah. be not that for you. I mean, my food came a little later because I was like okay. almost resistant to organic when I was a young adult. Like before I got married, I was like, those people who want the stupid organic food, I don't understand that. I was very pessimistic about it, which is ironic now. <laughs> I think the first thing I did differently, which was kind of unexpected, is I I moved I moved away from home and I went into a a college degree program that was pretty unorthodox, which was equine science. And that and then that's not something that anyone's probably necessarily gonna follow along with exactly, but I think it was that first time in my life that I allowed myself to go off the beaten normal kind of orthodox path. And instead go, this is crazy and it's wild and it's an adventure. I'm moving 1,200 miles away from home. I'm 18 years old. I'm going into an equine program that all of my, the adults in my life are like, that's a horrible idea for a career. What are you (laughs) doing? But I listened to my gut. My gut was saying go. And it was like that first time I listened to that intuition and had that grand adventure. And believe it or not, that kind of opened up my ability to think outside the box when the homestead came along and we started living our life differently than other people. Cause you realized that it was something you could get away with. You know, like if I do things yeah. a little bit differently, it actually still turns out okay. Maybe better. Yeah. The world did not end and it was, yeah. it was better. Yeah. Okay. If you could only pick one thing to do old fashioned, what would you do? Oh no. That's a hard question. <laughs> I don't know. Can, can food, I, food? Can we I just say have food? To be food? Is it, that allowed? If I suddenly <laughs> found myself living in an apartment in New York City, no balcony, no nothing, like I was in an apartment building, I would be hyper focused on my food and, and giving myself the outlet of creativity through food, improving my health through food, working my hands through food, all that. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Okay. The next set of questions has to do with children. And I know you talk about this on your blog, on your podcast, but a lot of us use our kids, and I think this might be like a direct quote from you in some way, use our kids as the excuse not to do these things because, if, of course, mm. it is more difficult to take the kids out with you, you know, different seasons of life, pregnancy, newborn. Um, what are some of your practical ways to incorporate children into all of that? Yeah. Um, again, Lisa, I think you're such an awesome example of this with the baby in your videos. You're just like trucking along, not even thinking about it. And my kids are a little older now, so I'm a little in a different stage. But during those early stages, I think it was that it was just a mindset shift of willing to think outside the box. So knowing that if I took my 18 month old out with me, that it wouldn't be this, maybe the most relaxing, peaceful gardening experience of my whole life. Like I knew that there would be a little more chaos, more interruptions, she might grab some plants out of the ground and pull them, but just kind of getting creative and working with what I had at the time. So I remember propping her up against hay bales. I remember putting lots of blankets on the ground and with toys. I I was never into the carriers, but I know so many mom, like you, you guys rock the carriers. It just always just wasn't my style, but I had jogging strollers and we had pack and plays that I would set up in our barn yeah, for when it was nap balance. time in the afternoons and it was the house was hot and the barn was cool and there was breezes and man just like is that idea of okay this isn't the most ideal situation in terms of like I'm not going to be super efficient today but I can still do something I can still get outside yeah. and I can do a few things and it's better for the kid and it's better for me so just that can-do attitude I think was the biggest piece yeah there's always some way to do it and I always say with for me personally I have kids spanned over 15 years now I can't not do the things that I'm interested in for 15 years. You know, maybe yeah. if, you know, maybe if you have babies really close together and it's just a couple years, maybe you you could. But for me personally, I do. I just have to figure out how we can still do these things even even with kids around. Yeah. And I think, dare I say this, but I think in our modern parenting culture, because we're so focused on kids and there's lots of reasons for that. Not all bad. Uh, but our hyper focus on children has kind of led a lot of moms to believe that their life should stop 
uh, if they're going to be a good parent. Like you're, you you kind of have to just put press pause on anything you want to do or any interests you have while your kids are at home or they're young. And I, I don't think it's necessarily supposed to be like that. I think kids are supposed to come along for the adventure. I think it makes better kids. I think it makes more well-adjusted and confident kids. And it makes the moms and, and the dads less frustrated because it's really hard. I remember, you know, when you are stuck in the house, was we have long winters, right? Being stuck in mm-hmm. the house with a, a newborn and a toddler, uh, the walls start closing in after a while if you don't have things to keep keep you busy. So right. I think yeah. we all need it. We all need to have a project to work on together. Yeah, it actually can make it feel less like those days. Those I remember those days and those days are long gone of the days being very long when you have a yes. couple of small children and there's really not much that you have to do for the day. It, it can help to to have some of that stuff and you can try it. And if your hands are in dough and then someone starts crying and you have to go back to it, that just might be the way that it has to work for a while. Yeah. And yeah. then when they're a little older, Everything they want you to break them. off a piece of dough and give, you know, we have, we have that yes. where the older kids can, can make bread, but then like the ones that are toddlers or three through 10, they like to do stuff with it too. Yeah. Yeah. We just take some creativity. Yeah. When you cook from scratch in your home, one thing that you might notice if you're new to this whole endeavor is that you need a lot of salt. Whether you are simmering bones for bone broth, you gotta add a lot of salt to that because store-bought broths come with salt that make it delicious, you gotta add your own. Whether you are making ferments like sauerkraut where you need a tablespoon of quality salt for each head of cabbage, Sourdough, obviously you don't feed your starter with salt, but every recipe calls for salt. I have 20 grams in my two loaf recipe. We use a lot of salt in this family because it is good for you and none of our foods come pre-salted. Now, because I am trying to source quality meats, quality milk in our home, I take that very seriously, it's a priority. I also want to make sure that we are sourcing quality salt. That is why I love using Redmond Real Salt. I can trust that I am getting a high quality salt for all of my from scratch cooking, my ferments, my recipes, they all turn out beautiful with my Redmond Salt. And one thing I really don't wanna do is run out. How many times have you gone to just make a simple meal and it's all from scratch so there's no added salt, you're out of salt, you almost have to run to the store for it. I have been buying bulk 10 pound bags of salt so that that does not happen to me. We don't have to rebuy that very often, but it's so nice having a large stash of that in the pantry that we can often pull from and refill the jar that sits by our stove top so that we never run out. Redmond Real Salt is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a discount. It will be automatically applied when you go to the link bit.ly forward slash farmhouse redmond again bit.ly forward slash farmhouse redmond i just clicked that link to make sure that everything still worked with it i added a 10 pound bag of salt to my cart and saw the discount so make sure to head over to redmond at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse redmond get your discount and make sure that you never run out of high quality salt for your from scratch kitchen okay the last set of questions is has to do with prioritizing so where do you find the time to, we, we did discuss this, but like, where do you find the time to do it all? I think part, partially the answer is that you don't do all of it. Yeah. And then um, someone also asks the true financial cost of homesteading. That's a topic probably all on its own mm. that you could refer to one of your podcast episodes probably for. Yeah. So as far as prioritizing, I'll just touch on that really fast. It, that's, I have a hard time answering that just because we have a weird life compared to a lot of homesteading families are running multiple businesses. And so th- my days look different compared to maybe most, but I think my biggest tip mm-hmm. is don't try to do it all at once. So if you're starting a business in this phase of life or you're on a, in, in the middle of a big project, don't be trying to learn all the homesteading skills at once. So like last year was the year of the book for me. I lived in this office writing a book. My garden wasn't great. I didn't really do mm-hmm. much with the cow. Um, I didn't really bake bread. So I had to focus on one thing and I kept sort some of the stuff in the background running kind of quietly, but it wasn't a big homestead year for me. It was a book writing year. Right. And that goes for, you know, maybe it is your homestead year. Maybe you just bought the land and you are doing all the homestead things and some of your other projects might have to go on the back burner. So just, you know, pick the thing, focus on it, but don't try to focus on everything at once. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is 
I do have help in my businesses, which if you are, if someone's listening and they're an entrepreneur or they want to be an entrepreneur, I think having that conversation with yourself and knowing when it's time to hire help, it's usually a little bit before you think you need it is the best time to hire help that can expand your efforts and take a lot of stress off of your plate. So that's a big, big thing for me. Yeah. With your, with your business and you have a a physical restaurant, you have Mm -hmm. books you're writing, you have the internet businesses, obviously, and the planner. How do you, I'm just personally curious, do you just make a to-do list each day or do you have set office hours because you also homeschool, which means that the day is not just yours to fill up 10 hours with whatever pursuits you, you know, you want. So just like real brief and practically, how do you make that work? Yeah, I am an obsessive list maker. And I do like I I sell a planner because I really do use that planner and I write in it, Mm -hmm. you know, multiple times a day. If I don't write it down, it leaves my brain. So we homeschool in the mornings and then I leave the afternoons. Those are kind of my work hours, but that can look like a lot of different things. And so there's afternoons where I'm recording a lot of podcasts or on other people's podcasts and try to block that out. There are days where I'm working on my own creative projects and I, and I try to do, I'm not like religious at it. I'm not perfect at it, but I try to do blocks of activities because I find the time it takes for me to switch from activity to activity. I lose Mm -hmm. a lot of focus. I think Cal Newport talks about it. You know, there's this gap where it takes you about 15 to 20 minutes once you're interrupted to get back into a flow state. Uh, or even just an an efficient state. So I try not to switch. So if I'm, you know, writing a book chapter, I'm going to spend my whole afternoon writing the book chapter. If I'm in recording mode, I'm going to try to do as many episodes of whatever in that block. If I'm working on graphic design, I'm going to try to do it all at once. There are always exceptions. But to me, that's the most efficient way just to keep all the, the wheels going at once. And, you know, if there is a day I need to go help work cattle, we did that yesterday or run to the restaurant to help. I know that the computer work isn't going to happen that day. And I just am at peace with that. Yeah. And that's, it's, that's the benefit. You you have the flexibility. I always tell myself that whenever like, okay, how am I getting all this stuff done? Like before we have this certain thing, like we went on vacation recently. Okay. I got all this. I'm like, wait a minute, but if I don't, it's okay. (laughs) I forgot. It's It's okay. okay. I know. (laughs) I know. It's hard being self-employed. I think I would be, I would have an easier time with it if I had a boss and I could be like, do I have permission to take off this <laughs> afternoon? And the boss would be like, yeah, I, you're covered. But like when you're your own boss, you kind of get in your head sometimes uh-huh. and you, I mean, I tell people, I'm like, my boss is a jerk. Yeah, like, my I boss is never, just. Like, I don't give myself a lot of time off. Yeah. So it's a brain game, I think. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm trying to decide if we should even go into this at all because I did listen to the episode. But somebody wants us to talk about Jill's recent idea of the rise of the farm influencer and compare your opinions on it. And I know right after I listened to it, it, Michelle had just messaged about this episode. And I thought we should talk about that. And then I kind of forgot to message her before this like came together very quickly. Yeah. And so I it's not as fresh in my mind, but I guess just like the basic idea. I definitely resonated with it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yes, that is a whole topic. And um, <laughs> that could be its own I, episode. I, I don't know. I thought I would have more angry people come after me afterwards. And I was really pleasantly surprised that a lot of people were like, oh man, I'm glad someone said that. Maybe there's, yeah. I'm sure there's angry people, but they haven't emailed me much yet. Also, if you're angry, you don't need to email me. I'm, that's not an Just open don't. invitation. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't. Um, but basically, my my whole concern over that is, you know, I've been, you and I both, we've been in this online world for a long time. We've seen a lot of changes and shifts. And I think one of the things that's kind of concerning me a little bit lately is just this huge focus on homesteading as an aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's not to say it isn't aesthetically pleasing because it is, and it it can be beautiful and it can be romantic and lovely. And it's okay to show those parts because sometimes they're authentic and true. But what I've seen is this, this shift in it's making it all about aesthetics and, and kind of overly staging it all the time. And, and this focus where it's almost becoming a caricature of itself. And so my, my hope, and I I laid it all all out in that episode, but I just hope that as people are in, in, yeah, it was, it was recent as they're inspired by accounts on social media and YouTube and TikTok, I hope they don't lose the piece that sometimes homesteading is hard and ugly and dirty. And if that's the reality, it's okay. If you're 
you know, your barn isn't beautiful. And if your cow pen has mud in it, and if not everything works out like it does for people on TikTok, like it's okay, keep going. And you're not a failure if it doesn't look like better homes and gardens worthy farmstead. So those were my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I took from it too, just that, okay, I think some people definitely are more motivated by aesthetics than others. And this farm fluencer with the aesthetic is reaching everyone. Maybe your message is maybe this is not the way you need to mm -hmm. look at this and do this. And if that doesn't appeal to you and you think like, I can't do it if it's not, you know, in an old farmhouse with, you know, maybe I only was able to get the white and brown eggs and uh, my kitchen hasn't been renovated. And then you think, you know, this is all it is. Yeah. It's not only this. And some people, like I do find myself very... I, I get, I'm very pleased by the aesthetic part of it to the point where yeah I like choose chicken breeds so that we have the colorful eggs. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I really do wear an apron every day, but that's my personality. And that might not be even remotely where you are. And also my landscaping right now, like everything about my place looks so bad because it's the end of winter nothing's growing. There's no leaves on the trees. It's just like the ugliest thing that the st the whole like area where the cow goes overnight needs to be mucked. And so I yeah. don't necessarily show that. And so even me, who I feel like I do show the very aesthetic side of it, like more often than not, I know personally that it's a mess behind the scenes too. And I'm not embarrassed to show it. I just personally like the, the kind of videos that I like watching do have the aesthetic side. And so I sort of put that together. But, you know, the message is yours, especially if you're just starting out on your homestead, it isn't going to look like that. And it might not ever. And there'll always be messy yeah. parts, even with the romantic parts. For sure. And I, and I, yeah. And I think we need people who have the aesthetic eye. Because I've been, I mean, I've been inspired by your videos before and, and your, your eye for design and decor. And I think we don't want to lose that at all. And, and the thing I do love about it is it's drawing in people who would never be interested in reading an article about a cow or how to can tomatoes. But watching people with those beautiful feeds, it's piquing their interest and it's making them think. And what I'm hoping is as they continue to think, they'll start to go, well, how could I bring some of these actual skills into my life? And maybe yeah. I could do things different and maybe it's just challenging their paradigm. So I think it can be a good thing, but, but yeah, I just, I hope that people don't ever feel discouraged by the, the fancy pictures Perfection. and I post fancy pictures too sometimes. Yeah. Cause, but man, definitely there's so many imperfect parts of the homestead. Yeah. We all have them for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. The more I watch even <laughs> like lot. the aesthetic YouTube channels or listen to if they have like a blog post or a podcast, like some of the behind the scenes, you realize that we're all in the same boat. It's just a matter of like how much of that we want to show. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, tell us about your new book, where to get it now. Correct me. Is it out yet? Or you just it launching is not it? out yet. So, OK, we're, it'll come out um, September 26th is the okay. day. So. I'm not sure when this when this episode will come out. So, it, but I'm I know it'll be well before that. But it's called Old Fashioned on Purpose, and it will be available anywhere books are sold. And if people want to pre-order, they get a whole bunch of fun bonuses. Oh, so they can pre-order pre -order like Barnes and Noble or their local bookstore, and then just come back to my little website, which I'll give you that URL in a sec, and then put in their receipt, and they get all the goodies. So it's uh, oldfashionedbook.com, and okay. that's where you can find out all the info on it. But it's basically a lot of what we talked about today just modernity and how we can keep that pendulum from going crazy back and forth one way or the other and how to find our place in this modern world. And I love having things in book form. I just love to, especially you as a creator, a lot of the stuff, you know, that we do, whether it's a podcast or a blog post or, you know, Instagram, that is sort of like sharing on the fly. But this book, this is something that you've thought through every little word and picture. And so having yes. your best work, you know, that that to me is valuable and being able to reference back to it, be inspired by it. Now, is it available for pre-order right now? It is. Yes. Yes. Cool. And just a little note for those of you 
it always, authors really appreciate pre-orders because it helps booksellers know what to expect and it just helps with that buzz. So if you want to order it and if you can order it ahead of time, that's, that's something I really, really appreciate. So awesome. Okay. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Jill. Again, appreciate you ha- coming here on the podcast again. We always like to hear from you over here. So thanks again. My pleasure. It's always fun to chat. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Live podcast, and I will see you in the next one.